The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Elisa Baum. I'm Grid Gain Systems Director of Product Marketing. I'll begin in just a moment, but first I want to conduct a little bit of housekeeping. Can you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me? And let me take a look. I see hands. Great. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute, but should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we'll take time to answer as many questions as possible. And in addition, a recording of this webinar and a link to the slides will be made available to everyone within 48 hours. I would like to introduce today's speaker. Um, we're having Dennis Magda. He is um, our Director of Product Management, um, taking over for Dimitri Setrakian. Dimitri is traveling, so Dennis very kindly stepped in to take his place. Um, Dim, uh, sorry, um, Dennis is, as I said, the, our Director of Product Management, but he's also uh, Apache Ignite PMC Chair, and he'll be presenting today how to choose the best in-memory solution for your app. And with that said, I'll turn the floor over to, Den to Dennis. Go ahead, Dennis. Hello, Alyssa. Uh, thanks for introduction. And guys, apologies for for the situation that uh, you are not going to expect to talk to Dmitri, listen to him. But anyway, so I'm not uh, a bad substitution of him. And today we are going to review uh, uh, the main concepts uh, of in-memory solutions, uh, how this uh, paradigm, how this uh, tendency uh, is being evolved all the time. And the main idea of uh, this conversation is first to show you where is the memory uh, computing uh, going, what are the objectives, what are the use cases, and what are the main products. And the th uh, second thing is to give you kind of a peace of mind on how to choose a specific memory computing product. Because there is a variety of different use cases. There, are, there is a variety of different applications. And the, since the memory computing becomes an inevitable part of main deployments nowadays, you as a software architect, a developer, will come to the point when you need to pick one of them in memory solutions over another. And so with, uh, throughout this conversation, we are going to see what are the options available, why the memory com computing became such a hype nowadays, and what you as a developer or architect uh, can learn from it and how to adopt in memory computing in practice. So. Uh, the agenda for today, uh, let me switch to my slide, so something is glitching here. Where is me? So, where is it? Okay, wonderful, here it is. So, some issues with my clicker. Okay, so the agenda for today is the following. It's pretty simple and straightforward. First, I'm going just to introduce uh, the memory computing. I do believe that many of you are aware about that paradigm. You know what the memory computing is, but I just want uh, to just to review this information to make sure that everyone who is on the line is on the same page. And also, I'll just uh, go into uh, uh, bring out several uh, myths uh, about memory computing, and we'll try to disapprove them. Uh, once we do this main introduction and coverage of the in-memory computing myth, we'd like to move with the product categories that fall under the in-memory computing. As I said, uh, in-memory computing is a big uh, market for the, nowadays. It covers many segments. And uh, as you know, many segments are usually split, and uh, you can have as many segments, as many use cases there are in the market. And depending on your segment, depending on your specific use case, you might want to use a specific and memory computing product. And finally, so today we are not going to do any technical demonstrations. And this is why I'll try to dedicate as much time as possible for your questions so that we have we can have a conversation over here. Okay, so let's start with the memory computing. But before we do this, uh, let me just uh, uh, benefit leverage from this moment and try to propose, try to promote uh, Apache Ignite community. So uh, in addition, as Alisa said, in addition, like my role at GridGain is the director of product management, but also I am an open source guy. I love, I like and love open source. 
I was a part of the open source community since the times of Sun Microsystems, when I was evangelizing about Sun products, when I was developing a Java a micro edition and was a part of the Java open source process. And since that time, I always passionate about the open source, about the community. And uh, speaking about Apache Ignite community, here is also an active member, contributor, and commuter. And also, I'm taking a part of the, uh, I'm taking a role of a, a project's uh, PMC chair. So, and what can I tell about this community? It's an interesting project. It's fast growing. Uh, there is a variety of different components and capabilities you can work on as a software developer or architect. Or if you kind of would like to blog or write articles about trending technologies, it's also a good candidate for you because, uh, uh, thanks to its uh, applicability. And so uh, the main point, come to our community, be a part of the open source, and you will, will definitely find uh, something interesting for you that you can work on. So we are welcome and we are hiring. So and now let's move to the main topic of today's conversation, uh, memory computing. So let's try to define it first. As the slide says, uh, memory computing basically uses high performance distributed memory systems to compute, transact on large scale data sets. And this happens in real time. And this happens orders of magnitude faster in compared to classical disk based system. So the main point that the main takeaway that we should uh, consider from this message is uh, that uh, thanks to the memory, thanks to the RAM, thanks to the capability uh, of uh, RAM technology that allows us to store data, quality, CPUs, now we can execute faster our applications. We can complete our queries and operations uh, much faster as well. And th this could happen only because at some point of time, memory became cheaper and we could install a service in our data centers that we are capable of storing uh, gigabytes and nowadays even terabytes of data in RAM, directly in RAM. And that allowed to grow, to boost the involvement of memory computing technologies. So, but first, let's compare in memory computing technology to disk-based uh, technologies. What's the difference so that, so that we have a kind of broad view on this? First, if, let's talk a little bit about disk-first uh, systems or disk-centric systems. Those are classical systems that we accustomed to work with. So the main idea of, uh, around that, those systems is that disk, your hard drives, your solid state drives, your flash drives are your primary, uh, data storage. All your data, all your indexes, all your information is by default will be stored there. Uh, and uh, there is a reason for that, right? Because uh, the disk will, will, uh, the disk were cheaper historically. And since uh, once uh, their uh, uh, market was evolving, you would like to store everything there. And if to, to if to speak about uh, the way you work with uh, applications that store data uh, primarily on disk, you usually use a classical client-server processing approach, uh, which simply implies the following uh, workflow. Imagine that you have an application and that application connects to your, let's say, uh, relational database that persists everything on disk. And then your application, if your application wants to do anything with the data, wants, wants to do something with the data, it would go to, your, it will issue a request to your database, it will preload data from the database, transmitting the data most likely over the network, and then we'll do some calculation locally, and probably we'll send some results head back to your database, and we'll try to update the database with final results. That's a kind of a classical client server process. process. Your client application gets data, from the server processes it locally and probably sends back a result set. The data result set, some entries that has to be updated, have to be updated. And here is if we talk about latency, uh, an average latency it for sure depends on the type of hardware, whether it's a host, uh, disk drives or solid state drives or flash drives, but usually uh, an average latency is, uh, is, is it's, it's about milliseconds latency. It uh, might be fast, it might be fast for your use case if you have some SLAs, but uh, we will see that milliseconds is not, you know, uh, the final point. You can get much more. Uh, 
And then uh, when we talk about memory first architectures, uh, about or memory centric systems, here is uh, the uh, situation is a little bit different. Now memory is treated as a primary storage and disk is utilized as a backup for your data. Uh, this implies that all the data by default can be and might be stored in memory directly. Here is we're talking about uh, depending on the product on the product type, you can store both data in indexes in memory and backup them to disk for the sake of durability. Uh, and when it comes to the uh, the way how your applications interact with your uh, in memory storage, uh, the in memory uh, most of the in memory products uh, they not not most some of the in memory products designed in such a way that in addition to the client server approach they support telecated processing uh, those of you who had the chance to work with hadoop uh, know a uh, so called map reduce uh, development paradigm when you as a hadoop developer need to create a task that task will be mapped to your hadoop nodes uh, then the task will be executed there and uh, then it will bring back some results for the final reduction. And calculated processing implies the same in the in memory world, uh, which allows you to write some calculation, send this calculation to your uh, nodes that store data, and execute all the logic there. Is out, and this helps to avoid data movement across the network. And if we talk about latency, uh, here is we are talking about nanoseconds and microseconds. It won't be allowed like milliseconds. In our in our universe, in the universe of human beings, you know, when I see those miles, milliseconds, and nanoseconds, microseconds, it just probably sounds uh, it sounds all the same for me. But uh, pretty soon I'll show you an example so that we can map those milliseconds and nanoseconds to our universe and to see how dramatically this latency uh, differs from one type of architecture to another. So let's take a look, uh, walk through the myth uh, that. Uh, we heard about uh, the in-memory computing light scale. So the first myth, so memory is really expensive, too expensive. Actually, I would I would agree with the statement, let's say 20 or 30 years ago, uh, but nowadays it's not that true. So nowadays it's, you can really find a lot of uh, servers, server units, uh, uh, machines that are equipped with a uh, bunch of memory. And uh, there is, and you can store even, you know, uh, not even just gigabytes of memory. You can store up to one terabyte of memory, terabytes of memory on a single server machine. What to say about, you know, uh, smartphones, or iPhones, Android phones. Now in your own pocket, uh, you are having devices uh, that usually are capable of storing uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data. And imagine these are just uh, smartphones. And the memory is not the biggest contributor to the price of iPhone, right? And this is why it's not that expensive, you know, to buy uh, uh, 32 gigs or uh, 34 gigs iPhone with RAM. And the same is true for uh, server units. The, uh, the price went down and now it's affordable. Yes, we are kind of also uh, keeping an eye on the market. We uh, saw that uh, the price slightly went up in the past three years, but the rise was not, is not, it was insignificant. So the price is, is still really competitive. At the same time, uh, if uh, when we talk about in memory and we are going to review different um, uh, product categories, when you hear in memory, it doesn't automatically imply that you need to store all the data in RAM. It depends on the product and depends on the use case. For instance, some of the products uh, while some of the products require you to store all the data in RAM, which might be uh, uh, not affordable for some of the deployments, while the other in-memory products uh, can use disk as a superset of your data and cache as much data as possible in RAM, depending on your budget, depending on how much RAM you have. And in that configuration, you don't need to push all the data in RAM. You store everything on disk, and you store cache as much as you can in RAM. And this is how you go get benefits of two worlds, of a memory world and the disk-based world. You're combining, you're getting in memory performance with the durability of disk. 
And uh, finally, uh, those of you who do not want to store uh, the full copy of uh, data on disk, you always can enable swap storage. Uh, the swap, the idea of swap here just comes from the, it's, it's just a functionality of, uh, just to remind you, uh, swapping is uh, a feature of uh, modern operating systems such as Linux or Windows. So the main idea here is that if a data cannot fit in RAM, operating system will trigger internal mechanic mechanism uh, that will swap in or swap out data from disk to RAM. And that can be used, usually Ignite or other products uh, support this uh, capability for the scenarios when customers want to uh, do not want to use disk, they do not want to persist data on disk by default, they just want to have pure and memory deployment, but also they want to uh, avoid situations when a cluster node runs out of RAM and it can come to uh, out of memory exception. And to avoid this, they can enable swap because once a node, cluster node, uh, approaches uh, uh, the boundaries of its local RAM, uh, the operating system will start swapping data to disk. And your uh, IT administrators will be able to detect the situation and scale out your cluster so that you can add more nodes to your cluster and the data will be distributed and you will recover your performance because after once the cluster is uh, scaled out, uh, you no longer need to use swap because the data will be distributed across the new nodes as well. Okay, so uh, the second myth. Uh, uh, that uh, claims that in memory computing systems are not durable. So it's true in not. Uh, so first, uh, it also depends on the type of a product, but usually or every, if, uh, if I'm not wrong, every product from the in-memory computing uh, realm supports persistence and durability this on that way. So what can we do about that? For instance, first, uh, you can use disk as your backup storage. Some of the in-memory computing systems, uh, uh, such as, let's say, MySQL database or VoltDB, uh, like VoltDB, it allows you to do snapshots. It allows you to uh, write all the changes to your append log uh, files, so that if your whole VoltDB cluster goes down, you're not going to lose your data. You can restart your cluster and preload and warm up your memory uh, from the snapshots. So this is how you can achieve the durability with VolDB. If to talk, let's say, about other products such as Redis, with Redis you can uh, activate uh, Redis on persistence capabilities and changes also will be uh, written to the disks uh, this and that way. It's also possible. Uh, when we talk about major IMC systems, uh, some of the systems provide tight storage so that, uh, that is not just a copy of, of a disk. It's not just stores backups of the disk. It doesn't store just snapshots of the uh, data that you have in memory. But that uh, in memory systems, they treat disk as a full-fledged memory tier. For instance, here is if you talk about Apache Ignite, uh, which is used as memory-centric database caching and processing platform, you can use Ignite own persistent storage that will store uh, the superset of the data, all the data you have on disk, and then you will be able to store as much data as you can in memory. You will be able to cache it in memory. So, and with that architecture, if your whole Ignite cluster goes down, you do not worry about data memory warm up after the restart. You're not worried, you shouldn't worry about the durability because once your cluster is recovered, your data is available immediately. You just start reading it from disk, and the memory will be warm up. To, uh, in background. And also we should consider that and should differentiate operational versus historical data set. In my personal opinion experience, when we talk about in memory, it's uh, we are in, in most of the scenarios we are going to deal with uh, OLTP workloads, with operational workloads. But also nowadays uh, you can see a rise of so-called hybrid transaction analytical platforms uh, that combine both uh, historical and operational data sets. And if you deal with such a platform that combines operational historical data sets and is capable of storing data in memory, then most likely uh, you are going to uh, uh, you're going to store operational data in RAM. You're not going to store historical data in RAM. Of uh, like it's pretty some of the systems 
give you a way to differentiate this data saying that okay historical data will be stored there and operational will be stored here and for operational i want to dedicate much more ram so it's all the possible okay let's go to the uh, uh third myth it said that flash is fast enough and i heard that uh, that message was heavily promoted by uh, existing uh products of uh, from the relational uh, market and from non-sql market people they uh, uh, databases or systems that were originally designed and defined as these based systems they would say why do we need that to have that in memory stack? just use flash or just use ssds they are really fast you don't need to get memory why do you need to go ahead and redesign your whole application if you just can purchase a new flash drive or ssd drive from let's say from other vendor. But in reality, Flash is fast, but it's not that fast. Everything is relative. Because Flash is far away from a CPU unit. It's tremendously far away. And Flash is connected to the CPU uh, via so-called PCI Express uh, bus, right? And still block device. And still, if your CPU wants, you know, needs to execute some operation, and for that operation, uh, the CPU needs to get data that is in Flash, it still will go through uh, operating system IO, IO control calls. You'll get data from flash to CPU registers. And only after that, it will execute them. It's a long process. And to be more specific, to be more concrete about the numbers, uh, uh, when you talk about DRAM, which is uh, probably uh, one of the closest big storage that is close to the CPU, uh, its latency, uh, uh, is in uh, nanoseconds. At the same time, when we talk about network, uh, the average latency of a 10 gigabyte network, Ethernet network is around, uh, is in uh, uh, microseconds, around 50 microseconds. And only then when we come to flash or SSD, here is where we're getting the same microseconds uh, boundary. And usually kind of uh, the, uh, the lag, uh, the latency is around 20 to 500, depending on the type of flash or SSD, depending on the vendor and its implementation details. And here is the final thing, the slowest one is uh, spinning disk, which kind of guarantees you millisecond latencies. So, and the same now, again, if to take a look at this uh, slide, you can say, well, yeah, and what's so bad about that? Uh, so for me, like nanoseconds, microseconds, like milliseconds, it's 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 too small, right? And it doesn't make sense to me. And so, but let's try to map these numbers to our universe, to the universe of minutes, weeks, and months and decades. So let's me let's say that uh, it takes one minute to do something in memory in RAM. I just told you that it takes nanoseconds, but for the sake of this analogy, let's call it a minute. So like every operation so that for CPU to get anything from uh, RAM, it takes around one minute. Okay, let's go uh, next. So then if we follow this approach, it uh, and if we were to do the same operation over the, over the network, it would take us a week or two to do the same operation, to, do, to get the same data that is needs to be retrieved over the network. Okay, if we were to do it, that operation in flash or SSD, it would take us a month or two. And if we were to do the same on a spinning disk, then it would take us about a decade. That's the difference between nanoseconds, microseconds, and milliseconds. So like whenever you think about a nanosecond versus a millisecond, think of minutes versus decades. And this is, that's relative to the, that's uh, nano, uh, so in our world, minutes and decades, it's huge difference. And nanoseconds and milliseconds latencies, uh, a huge difference for the CPU world. But CPU world is like tremendously long to go to disk or to flash. For CPU, it's much faster to go to memory. Okay, so let's go to the final myth, and then we can we are going to review our product categories. So the final myth is that I can use uh, in memory computing products only for caching purpose. Uh, it's it's not true. So. Absolutely, uh, you can use them for memory computing for caching purpose only, and this is uh, and the reason why so that why this myth exists is because many in memory products so in memory computing began evolving as a category as a market uh, uh, when 
the first products who was in that market claimed to do uh, caching, claimed to cache your data that was stored in some primary storage, such as the relational database. I just historically, that myth uh, was formed his, by historical reasons. And caching, right, it's use case, it's supported, and you can take here many uh, well-known and honorable distributed caches, such as Redis or Memcache. They can easily just cache your data in RAM, and it will be fine for that. But it's easy to adopt them, but like uh, the slide says, it's low-hanging fruit. Because once uh, the, uh, you cache your data, there might be a little bit more complex use case when you need to do something more advanced. And here is when you need to go to, let's say, in-memory data grids or databases nowadays. In-memory data grids or in-memory databases, they are used not as a caching layer only. Data grids can be used as a caching layer on top of your, let's say, primary storage, such as Cassandra or Oracle but also they can be used as a storage on their own. And the same is true for in-memory databases. That's your primary system of records. That's your primary storage. It's no longer just about caching. It's just about storing data, but storing it in RAM, closer to your CPU units. Uh, next, uh, and for tomorrow, so uh, as we will discover going forward uh, throughout this conversation, uh, the in-memory computing market uh, is being conquered by memory-centric systems, by more complex platforms that uh, integrate both RAM and disk uh, really well. They treat disk and memory as full-fledged uh, tiers for your data and uh, indexes. And those systems, they allow you to, they do not require you to store everything in RAM, as you would uh, require to do with pure and memory databases, but they can utilize disk. If you cannot fit everything in RAM, you can utilize your disk. It's that simple. Okay, so now let's uh, quickly switch to the uh, IMC product categories. And let's see what's, what's offered in the market. So as I said, the IMC uh, landscape is really huge and it's divided in many segments. And those segments are formed by the needs wants and demands of specific uh, use cases, applications, architects and developers. And there is no any single solution for sure. There is no any silver bullet. And then when you decide to utilize benefit from in-memory computing in your, for your own sake, you need to think over your use case first. You need to find your segment. You need to find what's the best option for your scenario. For this, or if you think that you need to evolve over the time, also probably you need to consider uh, an, uh, a product that will meet your needs of today and will satisfy your wants of tomorrow. Okay, so let's see. So the simplest possible in-memory option is caching that is supported by classical disk databases. Here is we can talk about Oracle database, Microsoft, Postgres, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or also here is you can consider uh, NoSQL databases such as Cassandra. Those databases usually give you a way to cache data in RAM, uh, but uh, and it's fine. What what are the benefits? So the benefit is uh, we will take a look at, at, at it pretty quickly. But ben benefit is that you don't need to change your applications. You just uh, pay for this extra feature, or you just use it for free if it's Cassandra, and you get your data cached in memory. But we will see implications and disadvantages of that approach uh, in a few minutes. Then we come to in-memory caches, we come to distributed in-memory caches. They also have a very well-defined use case when you just want to cache your data in a distributed fashion, get high availability, scalability, and benefit from their memory performance. But they are not enough for the use cases. And here is why there is another segment of uh, products uh, that uh, uh, can be used as an in-memory relational database. Uh, they benefited that you can talk to them using the language you know. If you already invested a lot of our time and resources in learning SQL, how to configure with, and work with relational databases, and in memory relational databases give you that way, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, you do not need to learn from scratch, you can just take, deploy them and keep using the same familiar SQL language. However, unfortunately, there is another segment and that segment is, uh, and there is a segment for, for in-memory data grids. And the in-memory data grids, as I will show you, give much more than in-memory uh, databases. Usually they're similar in design and architectures, but uh, 
while in memory uh, databases, uh, relational databases, they usually uh, provide only SQL APIs. Data grids give you much more. Oh, and finally, uh, memory-centric platforms. It's a kind of uh, the moment of uh, the momentum of the memory computing nowadays. Uh, those systems, as we will see, as we said, uh, they combine, uh, try to combine the best of two worlds of disk-based systems and in-memory systems. The main benefit of those systems is that you can use, uh, you can gain in-memory performance by storing data on disk, and also you will get the durability because the data will be uh, persisted on disk as well. Okay, so before we, uh, uh, now let's yeah now let's uh, start looking into the uh, into that options to those options. So the first one uh, in memory option of uh, disk based databases. So the first one uh, let's uh, as I said it's easy to support it. Uh, if to, if to take Oracle or Cassandra as an example here, you just need to purchase uh, uh, a special extra feature from Oracle if you want to store data in memory. Or you can just, if you're a Cassandra user, you can just use uh, <clears throat> raw cache and other extra capabilities that will keep a copy of your data in RAM. And what's good about that? You don't need to change API, you don't need to change your code, you don't need to do any migration. You keep using the same database, disk-based database, uh, but some of the data will be cached in memory. And what are the limitations? What are the disadvantages? Because if it was an, if it if it were enough, then uh, the in-memory computing market would not be created, and you, you would not have a variety of other products that we're going to discuss uh, further. So the limitations are simple. First, uh, uh, those databases, if to take a rational database as an example, you cannot you uh, you can use only RAM of your local machine because database such as Oracle, it's, it's not, it doesn't scale. There are some of the solutions, but in general, it's not scalable horizontally, I mean. Which means that your memory capabilities will be limited by, uh, uh, by the RAM you have on the local machine, which is not good. And the relational databases, they are not distributed, they are not horizontally scalable, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to Cassandra, let's say, what's wrong with Cassandra? It's just distributed, horizontally scalable, and I might enable uh, different uh, in-memory facilities of the database. But here is you will get another problem. Cassandra uh, caches data in specials. It, 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 cannot, it, will, uh, it cannot cache everything in memory just because otherwise you might face long running garbage collection pauses. And if this happens, you can start losing your data. And this is why probably you can do, you can achieve some acceleration within memory in Cassandra, but that will be not a tremendous uh, performance improvement. And this is why we are going to review other products of the categories that utilize memory and RAM better, and that can give you much more benefits out of the in-memory technologies. But anyway, that option is also, you, you have to consider this option if you just have SLAs that satisfy your local deployments and it's absolutely fine for you to cache just small portion of the data in memory and you're ready to go for that, in that approach. Just keep it in mind, it might be enough for you. Okay, so uh, what's next? Uh, what's, uh, here is uh, the next options that we are going to discover uh, of product categories. Uh, first, I want to, uh, emphasis on the difference uh, between fast data and big data, because there is a reason why I want to put this information out. Uh, the next product categories uh, they, uh, that we are going to look at, they usually target uh, fast data scenarios, because nowadays uh, memory computing uh, products, they try to accelerate and solve the needs of uh, operational workloads, of OLTP workloads. Uh, that usually like it's uh, kind of memories, that those are our classical uh, Mission critical applications that store our bank accounts, that uh, uh, record and manage our flight information, that do that and uh, this and that. And th those, they have strict SLAs. They have strict SLAs for low latencies. And they have to be consistent in transactions. And they must perform as fast as possible. And this is kind of complete and complete. And we have completely different story in big data segment. 
where you can do different calculations how how it's called offline like analytics you want to find uh, can i just accept this uh information do do i need to uh do i want to uh, approve a loan for new house for this person it, it's something that can be done offline let's say in a matter of minutes or in a matter of hours or days it's not that critical and in memory computing uh is presently at least targets the fast data segment here as you can see different in memory data grids in memory databases and uh, memory center platforms the platforms that try you know to satisfy the needs of the fast data segment first they can get some of the use cases of the big data but those will would be not real big data that will be some anal analytical workloads that can be uploaded to modern memory systems or distributed databases but overall uh, the next type of uh, products that we're going to review uh, are belong to data grids, data and memory databases, memory centric platforms, and mostly their targeted segment is, a, is uh, our fast data users, is fast data, fast data users. So let's move on then. Uh, and memory caches. So speaking about the uh, uh, that category, here is we have two good representatives, two well known and widely adopted representatives, Redis and Memcache. What are the benefits? of that uh, of those products it's all that simple you have a cluster of machines commodity hardware that is interconnected and you want to use it as a shared cache for your applications and that shared cache can be accessed by multiple applications the data will be stored in ram in ram so you get benefits of ram and you go beyond the local ram capacity beyond the capacity of your local machine uh, something that you cannot achieve with you know in memory options uh, of let's say relational databases and it's easy to maintain distributed caches in compared to local caches i do remember the times when i was a developer and we tried to, to come up with try to come up with various uh, custom caching solutions for every application we, we tended to have some custom cache and we would store data there and we would uh, evict the data keep it in sync with the memory database somehow but it was not that easy. So this uh, distributed caches approach, you can just deploy a single cache and it will be scalable and you can manage it from a single uh, from a single point. But uh, where does distributed caches uh, fail? Why it, why it was not enough you know, to stop on that and just to use uh, to benefit from the memory computing by relying on distributed caches? Uh, because here is, I just can uh, quickly uh, speak about one of the use cases where distributed caches come short. Imagine that you have your primary database, like uh, Oracle, Cassandra, your disk database that stores persist all the data on disk. And you want to have this data, but at the same time, there are some applications uh, that want to access the data quicker. And this is why they cache data in Redis cluster, on the in mem cached cluster. But what happens? The data will stay out of sync between your database and your Redis cluster. And unfortunately, with Redis, you cannot, uh, if let's say, if you change anything in Redis, uh, that change will not be uh, uh, persisted by Redis to disk automatically. You, as an application developer, has to come up with uh, different um, uh, techniques to keep in sync your database in your Redis or Memcached cluster. So it becomes your burden. You need to care about that. And that was a kind of uh, uh, no-go for many people, from, for many companies who decided, you know, no, so we can use Redis or we can use Memcache, but no, I have kind of that use case and I don't want, you know, to take care about data uh, consistency between my Redis, let's say, and database cluster. And this is when uh, the customers started looking in other applications, such as in other products, such as in memory databases, or distributed uh, in memory data grids. So the first one in memory database. Here is we have two good representatives, uh, MemSQL and VolDB. And also you can, uh, here is on the slide, we see a logo of Ignite. Ignite is not in, Ignite also one of the technical use cases of Ignite is in memory database. You just can people use it as a distributed cache or is in memory database or just as a disk based plus memory database on its own. And this is why you have your C Ignite here as well. Uh, but with uh, speaking about uh, 
kind of products that are primarily designed to be uh, in memory databases. So what they give to you? First, uh, they provide higher throughput and low latencies because they are designed to store memory in RAM, disk, memory, everything. At the same time, uh, they do not require you to learn any other querying languages. You can keep using that good old SQL. But there is a kind of fun minor disadvantage in that. Uh, that SQL, the SQL is usually the only API that is available, which is, might be fine again, guys. It might be fine for your use case. Here is we are not trying to find a silver bullet. We are just trying to think on the market and what are the options available. And also, as we when we were discussing the uh, a second myth about uh, the in-memory computing uh, products, which said that in-memory computing uh, in memory products are not durable. Even in memory databases give you persistence capabilities. Even with uh, memory scale and well you will find a way how to persist all your data on disk. Yeah, so over the time, if your whole cluster goes down, then you might be, you might need to wait while the data is preloaded from disk to RAM, but it, at least you have the persistence. You're not losing your data. There is an option for you. And uh, also, uh, uh, those databases are also good, especially if you start, let's say, a greenfield application. Because if you are planning, but if you have already running, you know, uh, application with some databases, uh, such as relational database, I don't know, do you want to replace your existing de deployment completely? Or you want just to reuse it somehow? And here is when you can rely on memory data grids. And that market and the product, and there are many products of this category. Here is you can find Apache Jury, Hazelcast, Oracle Coherence, Ignite can be used. One of the Ignite use cases uh, implies uh, it as a data grid. So, and technically the main features are the same as like one of the, uh, there, is a sim there is a similarity between Ignite and distributed uh, in memory databases such as highest throughput, low latencies, scalability, availability. Uh, some, of, most of the, uh, data grids provide transactions. Uh, they provide some data querying capabilities. But as for the data querying capabilities, here is it depends on the product. Like some of the products, uh, usually products give you key value access APIs, uh, while the others uh, invented their own querying language for advanced querying and filtering. Ignite, for instance, provide SQL instead of that. And when it comes to disk persistence, here is usually and that's probably the one of the biggest benefits of uh, in memory data grids in compare to let's say distributed caches such as redis you can deploy your in memory data grid on top of your existing database such as let's say oracle or mysql or postgres sql and all the data will be written through to that database automatically by the data grid for you that's the true that's the true use caching use case of existing deployments when you want to preserve it, you want to keep your existing database and benefit from the in-memory performance by deploying your in-memory data grid on top of your database. This is what the data grids do. But also it was not the end of the story because it's good. So uh, like then people and uh, companies wanted you know, to get something more and they wanted to give, to see, to support and they wanted to market companies to support a different use case. A use case when in addition to the capabilities provided by data grids, when you deploy your uh, grid on top of your existing database or distributed caches that just uh, live their own life, uh, you can, you would, they would like to have persistence and memory to be interconnected, to be treated as two different memory tiers. And this is how memory centric platforms uh, started conquering the market of in-memory computing technologies. And here is, I just can give you an example. We can just talk about the memory centric platforms referring to Apache Ignite or Green Game. So here is technically, if you take a look at this main uh, slide, uh, in the middle we have memory centric storage. How is it different? Memory centric implies, implies that memory is still treated as the main storage, for, can be treated as the main storage for your data and disk uh, data in indexes. Then, if you want to have the durability, you enable Ignite Native Persistence. It becomes your disk tier. And all the data, once you do this, all the data will be persisted cluster-wide across your nodes. 
and you are not going to lose your data. If your whole cluster goes down and you need to restart it, you don't need to wait while the data uh, is being preloaded from disk to memory. This is something that happens with data grids when you preload data from a third party database to your data grid. Ignite as a memory centric platform becomes fully operational once your cluster is recovered. That's what's uh, supported by Ignite. And so, it's, so, and that's the main idea about memory centric platforms. And then Ignite is a memory centric platform. Then it provides a variety of APIs that uh, you can find from uh, in memory SQL databases or data grids. Uh, in Hadoop world, you can use SQL, you can transact, you can execute computations in map reduced fashion and do much more. You can even do machine learning with memory centric platforms. If you need to do fraud detection, you don't want to ETL, ETL data. For instance, if you do some transaction, someone just tries to do a payment and you want to see if, if, it's, if it's fraud or not, you can do this using some machine learning regressions or classifications in that system. So it's simply to define what, what's, let's try to define what, what memory centric Ignite is a memory centric platform. Basically it's used, memory centric platforms allows us to use a uh, product for different use cases in reality. Uh, you can use, uh, for instance, to speak about Ignite, you can use it as a distributed memory centric database on its own. Like an Ignite cares about disk and memory for you. Or if you want to just have a data grid use case, you can use that platform as a caching layer and processing layer on top of your existing deployment. That's all important, important and available. And finally, if we talk about grid gain, how is it different? It's like a little bit of promotion. That's just, sorry about that, but we are doing the webinar and just want to uh, give you some ideas about that. And uh, above Ignite, uh, that is all the capabilities that are in red are available in open source in Ignite. And with grid gain, you, give, you get extra enterprise features that are needed for uh, enterprise deployments, such as uh, data snapshots for your Ignite native persistence. Uh, that's needed if you want to uh, deal with data recovery. For instance, if your hard drives uh, break down or just ruined, or you just erased some data in your cluster in your, on disk, you can use snapshots or backups to recover them. Also, grid gain provides monitoring and management capabilities with some security and auditing and data center replication. So this is what you actually can expect. That's the kind of uh, breadth and depth of memory uh, computing platforms and of memory centric platforms in particular. So, and finally, uh, let me finalize uh, my conversation with this slide, because actually this slide is, doesn't just compare Signite to uh, IDBMS, NoSQL, or in memory data grid world. It uh, should be viewed as a timeline of how the market uh, of this, how the storage market evolved over the time. First, let's start with relational databases. Uh, so those databases appeared in the market uh, many decades ago, 40 or probably even 50, I don't, I don't know exactly. And their, and their purpose was pretty simple. We wanted to, we started developing uh, first our applications for accountant, for banking, et cetera, et cetera. And we wanted to store data. We wanted to perceive the data on disk. The disk was the cheapest way to, uh, the cheapest hardware those times. And uh, the databases, since the databases dealt with uh, sensitive data, they provided consistency, they provided transactions, et cetera, et cetera. Then all the time in the beginning of this uh, 21st century, uh, uh, we started generate too much data. We as human beings started generate too much data. And the, in addition, first we had to store it somehow and all we had to process it efficiently somehow. And this is when a relation databases can no longer meet all the needs and demands of the growing and changing market. And this is how NoSQL databases uh, came into play. Uh, the NoSQL databases allowed uh, users to scale out, to store data efficiently uh, cluster-wide. They supported high availability. And they did everything this on disk. They had to sacrifice some of the capabilities such as consistency or transactions, but overall they fulfilled the needs of specific uh, market segments, or specific use cases. And they did that greatly. Then over the time, as we learned from this conversation, 
uh, the memory became really cheap. It became possible to store data sets in memory directly. And this is why we had now a memory data grid that can just be deployed on top of your existing deployments or used on their own. And they also as scalable and as available as NoSQL databases. They have probably some persistence options, but they're not as efficient as the options of NoSQL databases for sure. And they, but they provide calculated processing, they do transactions. And finally, the moment of, of in-memory computing technologies and the moment of, of our current world, now we have memory-centric platforms, such as Apache Ignite, that tries to use the best of both worlds, persistence and memory, and plus with that, it's a scalable solution. It provides scalability and availability. So having said that, uh, always, I hope that you learned uh, useful information from this conversation, because uh, the goal was to show you the, uh, what's the what in-memory computing is, what were the myths, and what are the product categories under uh, we have in memory computing. And also, uh, I'd like, my goal was, you know, to make sure you know different options. Whatever, uh, once you need, once you decide to leverage from in memory computing for your specific use case, now you, you will have better understanding where to look, because you know, uh, for depending on use case, what the best option would be for you. Okay, so I guess we have some time for questions. Yes, hi, can you hear me okay? Dennis? Yeah. Okay, great. So the first question is for me. Where, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. First, okay, great. The first question is for me, um, and it's where can we find this presentation? Well, I, I will be sending within the next 24 hours a link to everybody to both the recording as well as the slides. So it's on its way um, soon. Okay, the next question is for you, Dennis. What is the single writer performance? Single writer performance? Actually, I'm not sure I got the question. So probably I would just try to address it uh, this way. Uh, if, it's, if the question is related to the data grid market, uh, when you just de deploy data grid uh, above your relational database, uh, then actually with data grids, you uh, get, usually you get performance improvements for your read operations, for your heavily read workloads. But when it comes to writes, uh, the writes still will be persisted to a single relational database unit. And so the write performance will be dictated by the performance of your relational database that is usually deployed on a single machine. But when it comes, for instance, to memory-centric systems such as Apache Ignite, for instance, uh, that distribute your data across the cluster of machines, and if you use Ignite, Ignite persistence layer, then your write performance will be uh, offloaded across all the machines you have. So you are going to get a performance benefits for, for both reads and writes. If it's so, uh, in general, if, if it was not something you expect to get from you, so just follow up with your question and we can reply it offline. Okay. Oh, what is the difference between grid gain and Apache Ignite? I guess that I already answered on this question, but let me just uh, quickly go back. Oops, wrong slide. So that's like so. Uh, the main difference is that uh, first, uh, grid gain provides enterprise features. Uh, those enterprise features are uh, in blue boxes on this slide, such as data snapshots and recovery, advanced monitoring, management security, uh, rolling cluster upgrades, and data center replication. In addition to that, uh, like think of uh, grid gain as an enterprise provider for Ignite deployments. Even if you don't need to have any enterprise features uh, of grid gain, you might need to have uh, enterprise level support of your production deployments. And this is where when grid gain uh, can help you. We have experts, we have architects, we have professional services team uh, who will be ready to help you and make sure that your deployment is always up and running. Your Ignite or Grid Gain deployment is always up and running. Okay, um, well, we don't have that many questions. That was pretty much it. Um, if you guys, we'll give you another second or two. If you have a question for Dennis, go ahead and enter it in the go to bed 
webinar control panel. Oh, wait, just got another one. Okay, would this technology be suitable to use in a transactional ERP? So, uh, again, wrong button. Yes, so with Ignite, right, if you like, uh, uh, it depends, like, in Ignite, yes, Ignite provides uh, uh, ACID transactions. So you can uh, change your data that is stored across different cluster of machines. You can uh, move money to payments with Ignite. And actually, Ignite, if to speak about Ignite, Ignite has huge percents in uh, financial system. Ignite is deployed in uh, at, at many banks and financial institutions uh, because of its uh, transactional subsystem, which is asset compliant and which is efficient. Uh, when it comes to, let's say, uh, data grids, uh, uh, the data grids that not Ignite data grids. For instance, Hazelcast and Apache uh, Geordi, they also provide transactions, but you will get some, uh, I don't know, some limitations, probably not all the uh, transactional modes will be supported and available for you. Uh, and uh, the protocol itself, uh, transactional protocol itself might be not that efficient. When we talk, uh, when we come, let's say, to uh, in memory databases, now usually in memory databases such as VolDB and uh, MemoScale, they're transactional and they, here is you just need to look uh, at the different techniques such as whether that transaction is, can be executed across several machines or it can uh, span only across a single machine. It's something that I'm not, I'm not ready to answer on this right now. But when it comes, let's say, to uh, in memory distributed caches such as Redis. We know that Redis claims uh, supports, that it supports transactions, but actually those transac transactions cannot uh, get away of the boundaries of a single Redis shard. So you can just, it's actually, technically it's not about transactions, it's just about an ability to change records uh, that are stored on a single Redis unit. So this is why probably, in my uh, opinion, you cannot use Redis, for instance, for to do payments because usually bank accounts and payments are stored across different cluster nodes. And you can, for instance, use Redis only to do uh, local changes, for changing data that is stored locally. But when it comes to data grids and memory center platforms, those uh, products uh, allows to transact across uh, many cluster machines and do changes across That was my answer. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for one more question, and that is, when will the latest version of Apache Ignite 2.4 be available on the Maven repository? It's already available, so you can go ahead and download it right after this, after this presentation. Okay, that was a short question. I think I'll do one more. That's okay with you, Dennis. Uh, mm -hmm. Do typical production environments use Ignite persistence? And then in parentheses, it says native slash third party. Uh, so here is, uh, uh, it depends on the use case to use case. So I know that uh, Ignite persistence was released, let's say probably a little bit more than a half year ago. And we know that now the, the number, of, a number of deployments of Ignite persistence it's constantly growing, uh, but Ignite is still widely used as a caching layer with uh, on top of a third party persistence. So I get that nothing is going to change in that territory. We are going to get more and more deployments of Ignite with its own persistence, and we will keep uh, probably supporting the distributed uh, the Ignite as a data grid or as a caching layer on top of the uh, distributed, uh, on top of a third party database. So both deployments will present, and I get that all the time you're just going to see more deployments of Ignite persistence. Okay, great. Well, that brings us to about the top of the hour. I wanted to thank everybody for attending today's presentation. Dennis, thank you so much for stepping up and taking on the challenge of getting this done so quickly. Um, and please join us on March 28th. Dennis will be back, and he'll be talking about comparing Apache Ignite and Cassandra for HTAP or high hybrid transactional analytical processing. So that might be an interesting topic for you um, and we would love to see you there. With that said, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, we'll see you me. in the future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.